Hello and welcome to the Digital Forensics Files podcast. I am your host, Tyler Hatch from DFI Forensics. Today, we are doing an episode featuring Dave McKay from Blackstone Forensics. I've known Dave for a few years now. He's great at what he does. He has a very interesting and niche field uh, doing video forensics and all of that entails. So Dave, welcome to the show. Thanks for taking out some time to join us today. No, thanks for having me on, Tyler. Awesome. So video forensics, it's a really interesting field. Um, we've come across each other uh, a few times with, with common clients. You know, sometimes we extract information and then send to you for further work or analysis. So it's actually quite integrated what we do. But for those of us who may not know exactly what video forensics and all that you do entails, can you just describe what your field is and, and what you do? Sure. So if you look historically at what we call the, you know, where, where did video forensics or forensic video analysis come from. It actually started right here in Vancouver. If uh, you'll remember the first of the Stanley ah. Cup riots we had in 94, um, what happened or really what spurred kind of the, the field was at that point in time, you know, there were so many media, um, uh, you know, personnel covering that event uh, that and they had all this video footage from all these people, you know, doing, you know, carrying on whatever rioters do. Right. And mm -hmm. so if you could imagine the Vancouver police department at that time had all this footage from all these different media cameras, but they needed a way to systematically kind of go through it, uh, identify individuals and then take that information and, and use it in court to, to prosecute um, individuals that had obviously committed a crime. Um, because if you can imagine, you know, back in the day when, say, someone robbed a 7-Eleven, um, you know, 7-Eleven, you know, back in the 80s had video surveillance systems. And so at that point in time, the way that they were getting evidence from a videotape to court was playing it on a VCR. And when the suspect showed up on the video, they took a photograph of it. Oh, wow. And they used that, you know, as part as part of their, their court evidence. So... With the riot, it really what it did is it spurred uh, the ability to take a video and process it properly uh, so that you could get it into a digital format and then present that in court as evidence. Um, and so if you, you look at, you know, really what do we do? Um, the point of it is to make sure that we get the best evidence possible to court, you know, when it comes to video. Um, so we do a lot of, you know, examination, comparison, evaluation of video uh, for legal matters. And that's really kind of the, the nuts and bolts of it is uh, because you have all these different devices recording, as you meant, you know, in different formats, different resolutions, different frame rates. Mm -hmm. We have to be able to make sure that what was originally recorded on that device is exactly what the court is actually viewing um, because you know, along the way, there's certain things that can happen in that video, um, you know, i.e. posting it on social media, um, mm -hmm. editing it or, you know, different things that might change it and may alter the actual context of what that video is telling us. Right. That is really interesting. I actually forgot that that's where I think I knew that at one time that the field kind of emerged from. It's sad that Vancouver has the distinction of having to specify which Stanley Cup riots we were involved yes. in. Of course, there was, for those of us who might be listening in the U.S., this is uh, riots after the, the Stanley Cup uh, final of 1994, and then it happened yep. again in 2011. That's Vancouver right. fans are very passionate about their hockey. Some have drunk too much and drank too much and became fools. So they, yeah, they've been very open public, very defiant. We're ripping down street lights and climbing street posts and turning yep. over cars, setting police cars on fire, all in plain view. And you're right, there was a lot of media coverage. This was well before the advent of cell phones where everything was yeah. being captured by people on the street and it was all news camera footage. So yeah, really, really interesting stuff. And if I remember correctly, that whole campaign of prosecuting those offenders was wildly successful. Yeah, it, it was. And even more so, I think in 2011, um, yeah. because, you know, they had already gone through the process once um, and they really had it, you know, nailed down in 2011. Um, mm -hmm. So it, it was, I mean, you know, if you look at the number of charges that were laid and I believe prosecuted in the end, it was a pretty, it was a pretty high, high rate. So yeah. I think it really showed that, you know, if you're going to do something in public, given the number of cameras that are now around nowadays, there's a very good chance you're going to be identified. Right. Right. 
Now, it's not just as simple. Some people might think you're just zooming in and getting clearer pictures and and uh, and that. But like you said, frame rates and all these other factors that are involved in, in how the footage is captured really, really make a difference. Can you explain some of that? Yeah. So if you look at it this way, and this is especially when it comes to what we'll call security surveillance systems, uh, like stuff that you see in banks or the 7-Eleven, uh, even some of the stuff that you might have at your home nowadays, a lot of those systems, um, at least historically, would record in a certain format. Um, so if you had the video, it wasn't as simple as just taking that video and playing it on your computer. You couldn't actually do that. Um, for security purposes, what they did is they created their own, what we call proprietary format that basically, if you can imagine it, it almost like encrypted the video. So in order to unlock the video, you had to use specialized software to actually view uh, the video for that particular system. Um, so that obviously caused a lot of problems because it wasn't like we just had one or two or three of these manufacturers with these special formats uh, out there. We had tens of thousands of them. <laughs> yeah. um, and each video on each video system needed its own unique software to actually play back that video. Right. Um, so what a lot of what we do is we'll take that unique format and we'll forensically what we call transcode or convert it into something that you can then play back on something like Windows Media Player or mm -hmm. VLC. Um, the biggest issue that occurs is if you don't take video and transcode it properly from the original format, you can lose a lot of important details. You can lose the quality of the video, how it looks. You can, always, you can also lose frame rates as well too. So mm -hmm. you may um, actually be missing something that was originally there on the video. So it's a very important process and that's one of the first things that we usually do when we're, we're tackling a file is to make sure that we can get that video out of its original format into something uh, that is forensically sound and reliable mm -hmm. great description i love that um you break it down everything that you do is geared towards um being admissible in court which is the same thing for us blackstone forensics dfi forensics it's forensics in just a different context right we're all trying yeah. to get admissible evidence without screwing it up and and harming yeah. And, and doing things that corrupt the evidence in some way. So yeah, that's great. So my understanding of frame rate, so it's in video, when we capture say 24 frames per second, that's 24 individual snapshots of something. And then when you watch it back, it's viewed in real time. It looks like it's a yeah. continuous motion thing. Yeah. But if the frame rates are low and the action is quick and it can be deceiving what you see, you might see like a punch being thrown and if the frame rates aren't high, it may look like certain things happen in the video if you're not careful. Um, is that kind of a little bit about what is so specialized in rendering an opinion to help the court yeah. understand what they're seeing? Yeah, it's, it's what, what can you reliably say the video caught? So, for example, if we look at a regular movie that you might watch uh, on TV, that's usually at what we call a 30 frames per second or up to 60 frames per second. It's a high enough frame rate that it's going to capture everything. Mm -hmm. um, the issue is, is a lot of these devices that record video um, won't record at 30 frames per second, especially security video systems. Um, a lot of them can be set up to record as low as one frame per second. Wow. So if you could imagine, what could you miss um, if it's recording at one frame per second? You know, that's at one second in time. It could be a gunshot. It could be mm -hmm. a punch. Uh, it could be a discrete movement. Um, you know, that's one one issue. The other issue is actually how it records uh or how the system actually records those frames. So if you think of a video recording, say 15 frames per second, that's how industry usually breaks it down. Um, one thing that happens is a lot of video systems will record what we call a variable frame rate. So it may average 15 frames per second, but where is it capturing those 15 frames? Is it within the first half second? And then we have a half second where we don't have any frames or is it equally distribute throughout that that one second in which case then we know it could be reliable but if you have a video source that is not capturing we'll say consistently uh, and and the time between each frames it captures isn't consistent then that can also cause a lot of problems as well too right right it's good it's good that you have the expertise to straighten some of this stuff out especially for courts who may not understand some of these issues and judges and 
things like that. Tell me about your background, Dave. How did you get into this field? Uh, well, I started off at SFU. I did a, a Bachelor of Science um, at SFU. I was working in a lab. Um, what I was also doing part time is I was doing a lot of uh, cinematography work. Wow. Uh, so I was I was filming for a company in Whistler and Vancouver. Uh, we were doing uh, mountain bike and snowboard films. So I was dealing with a lot of uh, photography and, and video equipment. And I was looking around and you know working in a lab for, or a, a biology lab. You know it was it was interesting, but not what I wanted to do for you know the rest of my life. Uh, so I looked at BCIT Forensics, and they had a program there, um, the a Bachelor of Technology, um, and also a certificate program in Forensic in Investigation. Mm -hmm. So I actually enrolled in the Forensic Investigation program, um, got exposed to forensics, uh, got a chance to do a work placement at the North Van RCMP uh, in their Forensic IDENT section. And that was kind of just at the time where Forensic video analysis was really, really taking off. Mm -hmm. um, and I have to credit someone that really helped me along uh, along the way was Sandy Ferris. She was actually uh, a forensic ident technician at the North Van RCMP. And she was almost on the cutting edge of, of doing a lot of the forensic video analysis work. So she introduced that to me. And right away, uh, I gravitated towards it just because I already had an interest in, in filming and video mm -hmm. and and editing and whatnot. So it was a natural transition, let's put it that way. So it was basically merging the science, you know, the science, you know, the ability of to apply science with video. Um, and kind of that was a natural fit. So sounds uh, like after, it. Yeah. So after I finished um, my my uh, certificate at BCIT, um, I then was hired by the RCMP to work as a forensic video analyst within their forensic ident section. Amazing. Um, and then I started Blackstone in, I guess, around 2009. Congratulations. That's amazing. That's a great story. I, I draw a Thanks. lot of parallels because I sort of fell into a field as well that I just, I naturally had some affinity towards technology and, yep. and law and evidence. And I happened yep. to just find digital forensics quite by accident. And, and here I am and the same thing. Yeah. I decided one day to make a business out of it. And yep. that's, it's cool. I have a lot of parallels there. That's, that's really interesting. Yeah. Um, and I mean, I think that happens a lot. It's, it's, yeah. I think for people that get into forensics, a lot of it is, it's not a, you know, you're not in grade 12 and you necessarily, and you're like, I'm going to be a forensic investigator or, you know, because it's not a real common common career. So I think a lot of people that get into this field kind of, you know, find themselves there eventually just on some very interesting paths. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's interesting now to see how students can actually choose that as a direct career yes. path. Yeah. Now, which is interesting. And of course, there's so much more technology available now. And yeah, um, I don't know about you, but I, I love the fact that I get to be um, on the cutting edge of developing technology because you have to follow it for your field. Are you the same way with the latest yeah. video gadgets? And Oh, yeah. No, you have to. You definitely have to keep up um, with all that different technology. And, you know, it's definitely can be a challenge because there's mm -hmm. so much new stuff out there. Um, and then, you know, the other thing is, is I, I, it's a matter of trying to focus just on certain areas as well, too. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, there's so many different areas in forensics, especially when it comes to technology that, you know, it's very easy to say, oh, you know what, that I think, you know, that would be an area that I could specialize in. Um, but I found that you just have to really <clears throat> find your kind of your your niche and, and kind of stick with it. Absolutely. Yeah. You make a good point, too, about being very specialized in a very narrow lane. It's it's way better than being mediocre at a bunch of things. And that's why I love what you do, because I still get a lot of people that call us or lawyers that call. And they're like, we got this USB from a client. We can't open it. It's like, that's not me. That's go, go talk to Dave. That's Dave's world, not mine. Yeah. Or or what happens a lot. And I think you know this because we've worked on a couple of these files now where people are more and more recording conversations on their cell phone in their yeah. pocket. And so the, the end product is this terribly um, crackly, muffled conversation that's sort of somewhere in the background. And people come to me asking if I could do anything with it. Yeah, I can't. It's not my world. Yeah. But yeah. Um, you guys can do a little bit of that. Or is that part of what you do as well? Yeah, it is. Um, so we, you know, along with kind of the video analysis part that we do, uh, we do 
a lot of authentication work when it comes mm -hmm. to video and audio, you know, just detecting if something is actually authentic or if it's been, you know, photoshopped uh, per se uh, or edited. Um, and we do do a lot of, I find we do do a lot of audio enhancement as well too, mm -hmm. um, because like you say, one of the biggest issues that we face a lot of times when people are doing recordings, especially with cell phones, is they'll have the cell phone on their person, you know, in their pocket or someplace close to them. Uh, cell phone microphones are really good at picking up the person that's holding it, right? right? But if you're trying to record a conversation with someone that's sitting across the room, a cell phone is not a good device for that, um, of course, but everyone has one, right? So mm -hmm. what do you, what are most people going to use? It's going to be a cell phone. So we, you know, we have technology and tools that we can, you know, adjust uh, the speaker volume. So lower the volume mm -hmm. of the, the person recording and, you know, increase the volume of the speaker across the room to pick up more of that, what we'll call intelligible conversation. Right. And that's such a specialty. There's so many things going on in a sound file that you really have to know which, which sound waves are doing what or which frequencies are, are focusing on which parts of the conversation it's. Yeah. And, and, and at the end of the day, a bad recording is a bad recording. There's only yeah. so much you can do with it. Right. No, exactly. And I mean, that's, that's the other thing. It, it's the same thing with video, same thing with audio. We have certain tools that we can use to what we call enhance or clarify a file, but there's only certain tools that we can use because mm -hmm. we can only use the information that's actually exists in the recording. We can't add anything. We can't remove anything. So the, within the, the suite of forensic tools that we have, there's only certain, we'll say, enhancement or clarification filters that we can use to improve uh, a recording because if you start using different filters that you shouldn't you can start adding you know different artifacts and and things that right. didn't exist didn't originally exist in the recording and that's where you can get into a lot of trouble absolutely yeah and of course documenting everything that you did that's basics but some people might miss you know documenting yeah. everything that you did and before you know it, you're so many filters and yeah, it can get yeah, it, challenging no, exactly. if you're not know if you don't know what you're doing. So your specialty is very valuable, Dave. Yeah. Can you walk me through without naming anybody or anything like that? Uh, what are some of the typical cases and clients that you might work on, and, and who might you work with? Yeah, I, I mean, I think one of the we, I mean, we work for, um, we have clients on you know prosecutors, um, defense attorneys, uh, a lot of civil civil clients as well. Uh, law enforcement, um, more or less anyone that needs the assistance when when it comes to video. Because again, uh, the biggest thing is is we're not an advocate for the party that we're working for. Mm -hmm. We're an advocate for the evidence. So that's right. All that matters is we want to make sure the best evidence gets to court. That's it. Mm -hmm. um, I've had many cases where someone's come to me and said, "Well, um, for example, I think this file's been tampered with. They're my client. They pay me to do an authentication, mm -hmm. and." If it's not tampered, that's what they're going to get. <laughs> Sorry, you yeah. know, it's not tampered. So it, it's important that, you know, really at the end of the day, it's the best evidence that gets to court. And you know what? That's what we find a lot of our files are is, um, and, you know, this is not by, by anyone's fault, but a lot of times we find that when it comes to video, because we deal with all those different original proprietary formats, in some cases, when you may get disclosure from the other side, you may not get what we refer to as the original video. Mm -hmm. um, you may get something that's been converted. It could have been by someone you know, on site that didn't have the technology or the right tools to do a conversion. Um, I've gotten video that was recorded from a cell phone, right? Because the person didn't know how to get the video off the, right. uh, the device. So one of the, one of the main things we do with a lot of our files is ensure that we have the original evidence Mm -hmm. um, because we've had a couple of cases where the what was being proposed to have occurred on the video, uh, based on the video that we had, was much different than what the original video told us. Mm -hmm. and so I've got an example, a great example, if you want to hear that. I'd love to, yeah. So we had uh, a file. Um, it was a a criminal defense file that I that I, I worked on on behalf of the defense and the defense had received some disclosure information and it was basically a, an enhanced what we'll call a highlight video of of the incident 
that occurred. Um, if you can imagine uh, this facility where this incident took place, there was lots of different cameras. Uh, only some cameras captured the incident. Um, so a what we call a highlight video was put together. And really what it is is it's just to show kind of the sequence of events. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, sometimes what happens is when you create a highlight video like that, you may reduce the quality or the frame rate um, of the actual original video. Um, that was what was provided to the defense. So the first thing that I said is, well, we, you know what, we need to get the original video. Uh, once we were able to get the original video, it really changed the actual story of, of what had actually occurred. Um, I can't get into specifics, but um, it, it was, it was the, a, a difference between um, the individuals being charged with second degree murder and the Crown allowing a plea of manslaughter. Wow. Just because so, of what was found on, on the original video. Um, mm -hmm. The other, the other, a lot of the other files we get in, involved with is because they have video. Is a lot of police shootings uh, right. in the U.S. So we've done quite a few uh, files that way. Right. Um, and typically, what we find with a lot of video, especially nowadays, because you have so many different sources. So you'll have a, a scene, uh, say a police shooting. You know, what's what's the first thing that people do uh, when they see a police incident? They they call, they pull out their phone to call nine one one. No, they pull it out to record, right? <laughs> I guess so, that's true, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you've got all these people, you know, five, six, seven individuals recording video of the same event, mm -hmm. but from different perspectives. Right. So what we find is that in order to understand the true picture of what's occurred in an event, we need to get all those sources and somehow put them together chronologically and sequentially so that you have a full picture of what's actually occurred. And so that can involve viewing multiple videos at the same time. Or another uh, example is if you have someone that's recorded the audio and then you have video from, say, a CCTV system that doesn't have audio, we can sync the two sources together. So now right. you have video and audio together, which will give you even more information. So that's Absolutely. just kind of in a, a, you know, in a nutshell some of the stuff we get involved with. I love it. Everything that I'm hearing is is pro telling the true story. Like you said, you're not advocating on behalf of anything. If somebody wants to know the truth, this is yeah. the way we, we can do it possibly better. And sometimes yeah. your work reveals more, like you said, that's, that's interesting. And I find very much the same with what we do. And, um, you know, do you, do you find that there's some reluctance on your part to get involved in, in sometimes like a police shooting that might be controversial or, or have gotten political in today's climate or, um, or is it pretty much you're just seen as an objective expert involved in, in helping everybody you, arrive? Yeah, you have you have to look at it as just an objective expert. Um, yeah. Because the other thing is, I'm not making a determination on the on the case. That's not my yeah. job. That's for the trier of fact. All I'm looking at is a very small portion of this entire file. Um, and so all I can do in my job is to just make sure that you know, the video or the audio is able to kind of what we'll call speak for itself mm -hmm. so that when it's it's given to the judge or the jury, they can they can make a decision and be confident that what they're viewing is 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 reliable. Yeah, that's the whole point. Great stuff. And I, I just um, briefly, I want to touch on the fact that you mentioned all your U.S. clients. That's the beauty of digital files. I, I imagine you can work all over the world if you wanted to. Yeah, I mean, we can. It's um, I mean. The only the only problem is with video we ha there's a ton of equipment that goes along with it right. um, so I'm, I'm tied down to the point where because I have to have a, a physical place where I can I can do the work right um, but you know as far as getting files you know now that we're becoming more and more digital you know I, I can deal with you know different transfer sites to, to get information mm -hmm. from, from clients. It's not, you know, back in the day where someone had to send you a hard drive right. or they had to send you even a VHS tape to mm -hmm. analyze, you know, a lot of times it, it, it's um, just, you know, a few files that you're able to, to get a hold of. Right. Yeah. It's interesting. A lot of people are uploading stuff directly into the cloud. It's, it's really taken off and gotten very sophisticated. 
So it's a really interesting field. I was really fascinated listening to hear you talk about it, Dave. I'm super impressed with your professionalism, your whole approach to doing things right and getting things into court in the right way. Great job. Thanks for coming on the program. If anybody wants to find out more about Blackstone, where can they go? How can they contact you to work with you? Sure. Yeah, it's uh, blackstoneforensics.com is our website. Uh, and our email is info at blackstoneforensics.com. Awesome. Yeah. And again, I got to vouch for you, man. Having worked with you in the past, you're just, you're a pro. I love what you do. You're a great resource for me and uh, look forward to, to uh, working with you again on, in the future. Likewise, Tyler, I've enjoyed working with you as well. So I'm looking forward to it in the future. And thanks a lot for having me on. You bet, man. All the best. Take care.